Lesson six has two parts. The first part is on structure of matter, and then we'll lead into a discussion of temperature. Well, matter, maybe you've seen this relationship before in your chemistry course, and we're going to do just a little bit of review of chemistry because chemistry is important in understanding chemicals and their composition. That is important in our study of physics. And if you did a dive chemistry CD, then you had this relationship here where you talk about matter. Every physical material is matter. You can break matter up into two main categories, pure substances and mixtures. Pure substances, those can be broken up into elements and compounds. And then mixtures, those can be broken up into heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures. Elements are the most basic form of matter. Those are substances that cannot be broken down into other substances by ordinary chemical means. And when we talk about ordinary, we mean that there's not a nuclear reaction involved. If we look at a particular element or atom, we know that that's composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. We know that electrons, those exist in energy levels around the atom. And here I'm drawing an example of the atomic model described by Niels Bohr. It's not the best example of an atom that we have, but it's good for just drawing a description of where the protons and neutrons and electrons are. So we have protons and neutrons. Those are in the center. Those make up the nucleus. Electrons orbit around in specific energy levels. And I guess they really aren't just quite as specific as this picture suggests. This picture suggests the electrons travel around basically on tracks. But they're really more like fuzzy, cloudy regions where they move around. This atomic model example here developed by Niels Bohr that just helps us think about their positions with respect to each other and where everything is located. Now on a periodic table you might have like for example carbon might have a symbol like this a big capital C that's the element symbol then the name of the element itself is listed somewhere. A lot of times it's at the bottom of that particular box on the periodic table representing that element. The atomic number, that's a whole number. Do you remember what the atomic number is equal to in an atom? That's equal to the number of protons, right? And then that number at the top right is the atomic mass number. Remember what a mole of a substance is equal to? 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd particles. So 12.01 grams of carbon, that is equal to one mole of carbon, or 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. Some other things to think about is that atomic mass is the weighted average of the isotopes for that particular element. Remember, isotopes, those have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. We define an atom by its number of protons. If they have different numbers of neutrons, then those are isotopes for that atom. For carbon, there's six neutrons. That's the most common isotope, about 98.9% of all carbon has six neutrons. Some carbon has seven neutrons, around 1.1%. And then there are also other isotopes as well that make up a really small amount. I mean, I know 98.9 and 1.1 add up to 100%, but we've rounded those percentages. There are other isotopes of carbon as well. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope that's used in the radioactive dating method to figure out how old certain objects that contain carbon are. Something else about matter is that can it, it can exist in different phases like solids, liquids, gases, and also something they don't consider in this book are plasmas. Those are basically highly ionized forms of gases. Those typically occur with lots of electrical input or high temperatures. Now, why would a particular substance 
be in a solid, liquid, gaseous, or plasma phase? What causes them to be in those different phases? To understand that, a fundamental concept needs to be talked about, and that's the kinetic theory. Kinetic theory states that particles are in constant motion. So that means that the plastic that your computer monitor has on it, even though that's a solid, the plastic molecules are vibrating next to each other. They're just shaking in place. They're not like moving from one side of the monitor to the other, but they are shaking around in place. In a liquid or a gas or a plasma, though, the, the molecules are moving around in that substance. Here's a way to think about it. If you order these different phases from solid up to plasma, and you think about that when, with respect to the kinetic theory, particles in constant motion, and kinetic energy, that's the energy of motion, solids have a low kinetic energy, and you get higher and higher amounts of kinetic energy or motion of those particles as you go from the solid to the plasma state. So for a particular substance, let's say iron, for example, for iron to be a solid, those iron atoms will have a lot less kinetic energy than iron atoms that are in a plasma phase. Or for that matter, iron atoms that are in a liquid phase will have a lot more kinetic energy than iron atoms in a solid phase. One of the first contributors to the kinetic theory was a Scottish botanist named Robert Brown, and he observed pollen particles in water that were vibrating around. That was because the water molecules were in constant motion. They were jostling those pollen particles around, and that motion was called Brownian motion in reference to Robert Brown. So all particles have some amount of kinetic energy. They are moving to some amount. And that brings us to part B of this lesson on temperature. Temperature, that can be defined as the average kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. Think about water, for example. When water is frozen, when it's a solid, the particles have a lot, that's the the lowest amount of kinetic energy they can have with respect to the other phases is when they're a solid. And that's also when they have their lowest temperature, right? As a liquid, they have more kinetic energy and higher temperatures. When water is in the form of steam, that's its gaseous form, it has even higher temperatures than when it's a liquid and then higher as a plasma. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of particles in a substance. Now, there have been different temperature scales that have been developed over time. The English system is the Fahrenheit temperature scale. And for water, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point. 212 degrees is the boiling point for a standard air pressure of one atmosphere. For the metric system, we use Celsius. And Celsius just, that seems more logical to have zero as the freezing point, 100 as the boiling point. So there's 100 spaces, basically, between 0 degrees and 100 degrees. We're going in 1 degree increments. Think about a thermometer with 1 degree increment marks on it, or graduations, they're called. For a Celsius thermometer, there would be 100 graduations on that thermometer between 0 and 100. For a Fahrenheit thermometer, there'd be 180. Now think about this. There's a linear relationship there between these two temperature scales. And think about a linear equation. It has this form, y equals mx plus b. Where in this case, what we could say for y, let's call that the Fahrenheit scale, is equal to m times the Celsius scale plus b. So we could solve this equation and, and get a relationship between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Let's think about our slope here. 180 Fahrenheit spaces for every 100 Celsius spaces. So that's a ratio of 180 to 100 or 1.8. So we could say F 
equals 1.8 Fahrenheit per Celsius times C plus B. Now we could solve for B. Let's just think about that. When Fahrenheit is 32, Celsius is 0. So that means B would equal 32. And we have Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 C plus 32. Now we have a formula there that we can use to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. If we were given a temperature in Fahrenheit and we wanted to know what its Celsius temperature was, all we would have to do is just rearrange that formula there and solve it for Celsius. Just a basic algebra step there that you've been doing since pre-algebra. Now one thing that I've been discussing is that I don't think the most important thing is for you to memorize formulas. It's to be able to apply formulas. And I still think that's true, but there are some formulas that you use so frequently that it would be very good to memorize them. And ultimately, that's what I want you to keep in the back of your mind is that that is the best thing to do is to memorize all of these formulas. But still, the number one thing you need to think about is that I need to know how to apply the formulas in order to solve a problem. Here's one formula since it's used so often that I think is a good one that you really should try hard, harder than the other formulas, try hard to memorize this one. So put that formula in your formula notebook. Now let's talk about one more temperature scale. That's the Kelvin temperature scale. And there's a basic relationship between Celsius and Kelvin. Kelvin temperatures equal the Celsius temperature plus about 273 degrees Celsius. So if we had something that was 10 degrees Celsius, we'd say that that was 283 degrees Kelvin. This temperature scale is also called the absolute temperature scale. And it was developed by William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, named in his honor. Lord Kelvin, like most of the scientists that you'll learn about in physics that were foundational to the study of physics, was a Christian. And he believed, like I do, that mathematics is a tool that God has given us so that we can study his creation and therefore know more about him and have a better relationship with him. Now maybe you remember from chemistry class, the for gases there's a relationship between pressure and temperature and also volume and temperature. There's a linear relationship there. For example, if this was our volume axis and this was our temperature axis, we had several volume temperature data points there. We could draw a line through those points and what would happen is we could just extend that line down until our volume equaled zero. At that point, that would be, if this temperature scale was in Celsius, that would be about minus 273 degrees Celsius. Now, of course, we can't get a volume of zero. So in theory, though, this is what would happen if we extrapolated that linear relationship out until we had a volume of zero. And it doesn't matter what gas we're talking about. If we had another gas that maybe had a pattern like this, we could still find that that relationship would end up at minus 273 degrees Celsius. Keep in mind our kinetic theory. We're saying this is absolute zero here. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy in a particle. So if this is absolute zero, does that mean that there's no motion in the particles at this particular temperature? Well, no, not really. There's, that's like the lowest amount of energy that it could possibly have. That's the best way to think about it. So here's another formula to keep in mind to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. And of course, you could also use that same formula to convert from Kelvin to Celsius. Let's go ahead and do some practice problems now. First, I want you to convert minus 34 degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. Now, try not to get confused on these problems. Up to now, every time we do a conversion from one unit to another, all we do is multiply by one or more unit multipliers. 
But in temperature relationships like this, there's a formula that's involved. So I like to just write that formula down. F equals 1.8 times Celsius plus 32. I want to solve for Celsius. I've been given Fahrenheit here. So let's just go ahead and substitute that in. Minus 34 is equal to 1.8 C plus 32. We could subtract 32 from both sides and we'd end up with a minus 66 on the left side equals 1.8 C and divide both sides by 1.8 that would equal about a minus 36.7 degrees Celsius. Now we had two significant digits to start with right so we need to say minus 37 degrees Celsius. So that's our answer. Just remember when we use significant digits we're sacrificing accuracy for the sake of precision. Our answer cannot be more precise than the measurement. And in the real world we're really not going to do that. We don't want to sacrifice accuracy. We want to be both accurate and precise. So we want to use the most sensitive instrument possible in our measurements. But really what we're using significant digits for in this physics book is just so that everybody gets the same numerical value for the answer. Let's do a couple more problems. Let's convert 407 Kelvin to Celsius and then in C go 211 Celsius to Kelvin. If you want to pause the CD and figure those out on your own, you can and then turn the CD on and check your work. Think about our formula here. Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273. And just something else to keep in mind, we don't use a degree symbol when we talk about Kelvin. Just when we're talking about Celsius or Fahrenheit. So if we're solving for Celsius in problem B, that means we'll have to do Kelvin minus 273. 407 minus 273, that's equal to 134 degrees Celsius. So there's our answer with three significant digits since our given value had three significant digits. Then in C, we're just going to add 273 to that 211 there. And so we end up with 484 Kelvin. Don't put a degree symbol on the Kelvin. So we've talked about matter in this lesson, the structure of matter, and looked a little bit at atoms and their composition. And then we talked about the different phases of matter. We talked about why those are different because of the kinetic theory. Particles are in constant motion and they, we have these different phases because of the particles having different differing amounts of kinetic energy. Larger and larger amounts of kinetic energy allow a substance to convert from a solid to a liquid and then a liquid to a gas, a gas to a plasma. We also discussed that temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy in a substance. So that means that all the particles in a substance aren't moving with exactly the same kinetic energy. There's an average kinetic energy there. Some are moving slower, some are moving faster, some are moving at the average speed. We have different temperature scales that have been developed over time and we looked at some formulas there that we can use to help us convert from one temperature scale to another. Make sure you put those formulas in your formula notebook. Okay, well that's all for lesson six.